the, and where's the recording? It's recording, okay. Um, we're recording, but we're not broadcasting YouTube because it's, it won't let me in. I'll keep trying, you guys go ahead. Okay, Linda, oh, mute yourself, Linda. Just give us one more minute for Robert Rattet. Uh Let me just, because uh, he's joining us. He going, was... So I did not, I don't see here. That's weird. Um, let's see what we can do here. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Mark, why don't you make me a co-host? Yeah, no, good idea. Just, okay. and let me just let him know, Mark. Okay, well, hi there, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We're just waiting for one more of our panelists to join us, but let me give you a, a basic rundown of, of this. The idea here, as you know, is that a lot of, um, a lot of, minority owned and women owned businesses did not get the funding they'd anticipated. It wasn't easy. It had a lot to do with their relationships with their banks, with lenders, also the ways of doing business, which are, you know, changed a lot over the years. And so um, one of our committee members, uh, BCI Business and Consumer Issues Committee members, Madeline Innocent, uh, came up with an idea that we reach out directly to minority owned and women owned businesses that can really give granular information on what to do and, and resources on, on how to help businesses, um, small businesses get access to funding. Now I should introduce myself. I'm Linda Alexander. I am co-chair of uh, Community Board 7's Business and Consumer Issues Committee. And uh, I'm here with, with uh, my co-chair is uh, Christian Cordoba. And uh, we are here with our uh, Community Board 7 Chair, Mark Diller, and several members of Business Consumer Issues Committee. So let me give you a brief idea of um, a brief rundown of the people of our, of our, um, of our, our panelists, because they are amazing. So we're going to be hearing from, and we're waiting for him to join us, uh, Robert, Rittet, Robert L. Rittet. He's a partner at David Off Hutcher and Citron LLP. And he chairs, he co-chairs the firm's bankruptcy practice group. During a career spanning more than 45 years, he has represented such noteworthy clients as John DeLorean, uh, New Rock, Harley Davidson, Angelo and Maxis, La Marina, and Brother Jimmy's. David Off Hutcher and Citron LLP is one of New York's most respected mid-sized commercial law and government relations firms with offices in New York City, Albany, Washington, D.C., and White Plains. We are going to be hearing from Madeline D. Marquez, uh, who's the Senior Vice President of Quants Bank and Chief External Affairs Officer. Ms. Marquez oversees the CRA uh, component of the bank, as well as SBA initiatives, CDFI initiatives, community development programming, nonprofit initiatives, and all community affairs events. Bons Bons Bank, Founded in 1960, 60, has 13 branches in New York and New Jersey. It is a minority deposit institution, an MDI, and a certified community development financial institution, a CDFI. And we're going to hear from Sherry Lane, Executive Director of Capital Access and Center Operations for New York City Small Business Services, SBS. And Ms. Lane oversees the city's network of business solution centers and industry business service providers which provide free services to entrepreneurs and business owners in all boroughs. These free services include business courses, legal assistance, and help, they help navigating and selling to government and financing assistance. She also oversees SBS's capital access program, which includes managing multiple funds that aim to reduce the financing barriers for underserved business owners. And rounding out our panel will be Patricia Daly. Deputy Chief of Diversity, Office of Comptroller, Scott M. Stringer. Ms. Dalek focuses on Comptroller MWBE University, which is a, uh, runs a series of workshops specifically designed to increase access to contracting opportunities for MWBEs. She also advises the Comptroller on policy recommendations that change how New York City does business with 
women and people of color um, through reports such as Making the Grade. Uh, so previously, Ms. Dalek served as the advisor of diversity policy at the Office of New York City Comptroller and the assistant director of policy at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. And so without further ado, we are going to start with um, Ms. Marquez, Madeline Marquez, and uh, she'll, she'll help us with that, and I will be right back. Madeline, can you unmute yourself and, and talk about some of the initiatives that we have? Well, good afternoon all. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Madeline, for the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, as Linda stated, um, Ponce Bank is, has been, uh, was established in 1960 and we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. Um, we've served on the bank communities since our inception and we will continue to do so because it is part of our mission, our vision, and our core values. With that said, I'm hoping to cover our, our PowerPoint presentation that we've created for companies, whether they're a startup or an existing entity as to what you need to do to obtain financing and how to package your, your loan request. Um, I'm trying to take a 20 minute presentation and shrink it into and zoom it into a five minute presentation for you all. Um, with that said, um, just real very quickly, there's two types of loans, they're secured and unsecured. And as the words will state, the secure ones, you have to provide some kind of collateral for it. And the unsecured ones are just what they say, they're unsecured, nothing covering them at all. Um, we're used to having um, other, either a short-term loan or long-term loan, and based on our repayment ability, um, most businesses would need uh, long, longer-term loans. Uh, we also know and we're very familiar about what a revolving credit is, and mostly that is the cards that we carry with us that many entrepreneurs use to finance their companies as well, believe it or not. So those are the basic types besides a personal loan and besides a fixed asset loan and, and letters of credit. So that in itself is the realm of what banks offer in a nutshell as it relates to loans. Um, and of course, I forgot to mention the real estate loans that could be covered by SBA programs. Um, I want to go into what lenders go about looking for when you submit a request. They want to know how you handled your credit in the past. They want to know how you've repaid the, your credit in the past and the types of credits that you have, okay? So that's something to look at when you're looking at your own credit reports. They want to know how much debt you've carried, how you can afford to repay that debt, and the ability and intent to repay. So if you have any blemishes on your credit reports, um, I, I advise you to please try to clean those up as, as, as you go along in terms of trying to obtain credit. Um, and then I think most importantly is what kind of cash flow do you have to repay back? So I'm covering a generic holistic approach of how to go about packaging your request. Um, I think it's key that you be prepared and that you understand what exactly you're going to use the funds for. Whatever you do, do not tell a banker, oh, just give me whatever you can because that tends to shut down a banker and it implies that you're not ready to even be considered. Um, believe it or not, that's, a, that's an automatic declination. So you need to be prepared and understand what it's gonna cost you if you're gonna acquire equipment or working capital, delegate and identify what that working capital will be used for. Um, do you have equity to contribute someone? You gotta have skin in the game, as they say, for a bank to feel comfortable in providing you with, with a loan. Do you have any collateral? Um, are you ready to go to a bank? Because there are many other lenders that are not financial institutions that can also afford you the ability to get capital that's not a bank. So you have to do your homework in terms of the type of lender and the type of loan that you're also looking for. Alternative financing mechanisms are all over the city of New York and I believe my other colleagues will cover that. So I will just keep on going as fast as I can. Um, are you planning to shop around? Which banks are you going to? And you gotta remember that, believe it or not, although banks are competitors, we talk to each other. And, we t and so you're gonna have to tell the same story to the, same, to the banks you go to because we do communicate with each other. Um, if you're shopping around, remember that, be careful with what you say and, be, and know that bankers do talk to each other. In terms of being prepared, you gotta do your homework and 
I have a little uh, example of how you can go about doing that. When I first started doing this presentation years ago, it was the age of um, binders and files. Now is the age of flash drives. So let's use that as the example. It's a place where you can keep all of your documents for creating this package so that you'll be prepared at all times. So with that said, let's talk about a little, a little bit about the history of the company. You have to include that. If you're a startup, then you have to identify what makes you different within that industry. If you're an existing company, then your history has to be, what I say, down pack. Okay? Management, we tend not to talk about ourselves as managers of these companies. And let me tell you, that's the most important part because the business is nothing without you as the manager. So highlight all of your qualities, all of your, 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 your good um, management skills that basically get introduced into the company and are a reflection of the company. Um, do you have as a business any special issues like specific to an industry, licensing, certificates, what are they? You have to at least have a copy of those and either copy it to this flash drive or dump it into this binder that as we go along, we're gonna be creating. Um, you got to start with your finances, and Robert um, will get into that, but you basically need to understand the use of funds, the sources and uses. Um, we look for a resume, believe it or not, and the traditional resume. And many business owners, they've been in their business 10, 20 years, they don't have a resume. We'll make one up because your ability and what you do in your company is important to us as bankers. And also we need resumes of key people that are helping you manage your company. Um, there's a nice form on the, on the SBA.gov um, website. It's called the SBA uh, form 912, which can help you do that. In terms of owners, uh, Robert will get into this. You've got to know and complete a personal financial statement. You've got to understand what your personal tax returns are, include your personal history, um, in terms of a financing request, understand what it is that you're asking for. Are you asking to buy equipment? What exactly is that? In terms of your business, if you're in business for more than three years, then of course we're going to need the three years financials. We're also going to need your corporate tax returns that Robert can get into later. We're going to need to understand, based on your projections, where it is you want to go with this financing. Okay? And you have to start with the balance sheet, the income statement, and adjust all of that accordingly to what it is that you're requesting. Um, do you have any existing debt? And if you do, then highlight what that is and identify what it was used for. Um, basically, many companies have affiliates, but those are mature companies, startups are not gonna have any affiliates and mid-sized companies may. So if you have an affiliate, do a quick little blurb about what that affiliate is and at least identify through corporate tax returns what kind of size of, uh, of an affiliation it is. Um, there's a couple of entities that you need to familiarize yourself with. We use the Dun & Bradstreet report as a credit report on that entity. So I advise you to go to www.dmb.com and in there, provide the information on your company. Let me give you an example. If you go to a bank and you're not in the DMB system, well, the bank's gonna request a report and they're gonna come back and investigate you and inquire that. So from a company perspective and a business perspective, i rather provide them with the information I want DMB to have so that everybody else has the same thing. And also it will not slow down your package because you're already in the system. The other thing that you need to be aware of, of course, is the actual three entities that are going to provide credit information on the personal and or owner of that entity. So that's the TransUnion and all the world, Equifax and the experience, and please know what your credit score are. Know also that you're entitled to one free credit report from each of these entities on a yearly and annual basis. So that's something that should be promoted to us small entrepreneurs, whether they be minority owned or, or regularly owned. Um, and I think another little kept secret is that we, from a banker's perspective, we compare your businesses to what's called Risk Management Association, RMA. And many of our entrepreneurs are not aware of that. So if you're going to provide us with financials and or projections, that's the only place we go to compare what you have and are you in sync. So I would uh, recommend that you also familiarize yourself with that. Compare your business history to the industry. Familiarize yourself with the competition in your industry. And know that banks and SBA will use the RMA report to um, insert in their underwriting mechanism. Okay.
Thank there you. are many, there are many other, there are many programs that you qualify for as an entrepreneur. SBA has the most lenient ones in terms of startups and in terms of mid-site companies, and it's also known as the SBA 7A program. Uh, also know that uh, for the last three or four months, I've um, initiated on the Ponce Bank the PPP program, which is for payroll. Um, and if you, any of you are interested in that, we are open at this point in time and accepting applications, but that is only to complete payroll, not for working capital. Um, I believe that SBA also had an EIDL loan that you can qualify for on, under the disaster mechanism that the government um, designated us for, and that you can use for working capital. And then you have the regular 7A programs that can be used for anything and everything. Um, I am going to basically leave it there in terms of the lending capacity. Um, I, if you take into account everything I basically stated you need to have in this flash drive or in this binder, that in essence will constitute your business plan and or your proposal to a banker. All of that information they're gonna to wanna to know, regardless if you're going for a $15,000, $20,000 loan, it's small in scale versus millions of dollars. The same type of information, regardless of loan size, is required, but with an in-depth um, attitude if you're gonna have a larger loan. I'm going to leave it at that and tell you that basically with that flash drive and that binder, you can be prepared at any point in time to provide your package to a banker that may be interested learn what we call your elevator pitch, um, learn to talk about your company in one to two minutes and highlight that, keep it current, update it when needed and copy when needed. Um, and I will end with that at this point in time. And I think I was under my six minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. Great. Uh, well, I wanted to let everyone uh, know, we're gonna hear from Robert Rutet in a moment, but uh, uh, every, if you have questions, please put them in the chat area and we will be reading them. And if you want to come on camera to discuss them, that's fine. So at the end of the presentations, we will, we will read your question to your questions to, you know, for the individual panelists. And so um, I'd like to introduce um, Mr. Robert Rutet and um, he will tell you legal standpoint of, of this. And thank you so much, Madeline. That was amazing. Thank you. I didn't think I could do it. <laughs> I zoom everything in. Thank you. Thank you, Linda and Madeline. Right. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Rutan. I'm a partner with Davidoff, Hutcher, and Citroen, a firm in the city, who is very active in the, the city itself and those things that move around it. Uh, I'm educated in the South, okay, but I moved to New York more than 40 years ago. And I'm an experienced bankruptcy lawyer who especially is right, re restructuring small to, to mid-cap businesses. And Linda asked me to talk to you about how you avoid me, and that's okay by me. I'm happy to figure out a way right, to avoid my, having, to, having to address the problems. Right? There are many challenges uh, that are facing with small businesses, and as it's been particularly with startups. With regard to startups, uh, the first issue you need to cover is you need a form of corporation. A lot of people forget they started their own businesses out of the back of their uh, car or in a small shop. You want to avoid personal liability. If you don't form a corporation or a limited liability corporation or one of those protected environments, you can lead to personal liability for things you didn't intend. The, and if you're going to have a partner, make sure that you have a shareholders agreement. You may never look at it again until there's a problem between you and your partner. So concomitantly look at both. Uh, all right. It's, it, but in getting into a small business, most of the small businesses that I have seen over the years are undercapitalized, have limited funding. All right. And you have to understand that the success rate for most businesses is um, on them, less than 50%, of them, right, they will succeed for any lengthy period of time. Okay? But the main reason that you can succeed in the business is using, learning to use management tools. And it starts with having uh, the necessary uh, accounting information at your fingertips, 
and making sure that your accountant right, understands how to produce these, these items for you. One of them is the monthly statement. Believe it or not, I can't tell you how many corp companies I've seen over the years that forgot how to balance their checkbooks and do the basic minority, um, minor skills like right, balancing those checkbooks, making sure that their credit cards gets reimbursed, this, and, and negotiating the rates of the credit card processing companies. Right? Issuing to yourself, let alone to the bank, a regular quarterly financial statement so that you know exactly what you're doing. Right? And then when it comes to dealing with bankers, okay? All right. the idea of having your own personal projections and cash flows uh, are something that, well, why would I do that if I'm not applying for a loan? Actually, you do it so that you get an understanding of how your cash works during the course of a business. All right? if, you're, if you're in the cash business, like a grocery store, you know, your cash in, cash out, and your cash flow is exact, will match up neatly. But if you're selling goods on, on credit, or all right, then buying goods on credit, then they don't match up. And that's why you have to use a cash flow to figure out all right, if you're going to have the money necessary to pay the bill for the goods you bought or that you have sold. For example, most people sell uh, net 30 terms. And most people then think that, well, net 30 means in 30 days I'll, or less, I'll collect. But in reality, uh, it's more like 45 to 50 days between time of invoicing and times of collection. So you really have to be cognizant of what your cycle time is in terms of billing and collection. So you need, in order to be able to understand that, you have to get an aged accounts receivable done. It's a new skill set. Okay? Depends on what you're doing and how you're collecting. That, and that directly reflects in terms of your cash flows. So when you go to the bank, okay, the bank returns to you and says, well, what do you need the money for? Okay? And then how are you going to repay me? A properly constructed projections will tell them that you're going to use the property, the money that you're borrowing, right, to make a successful business, which will produce an income. And the cash flow will tell you how, what income you will have available at the moments that are necessary to be able to service the obligations of the, from the bank or the lending institution. And putting those two ideas together, they seem like they should be one item, but they're really two, okay? Oh, and there's one thing that frequently falls by the wayside, right? I recommend highly that you use a tax service. It's easy to borrow from the government, but there's a 25% penalty tacked on that. So make sure you pay your payroll taxes on, a, on an orderly basis. And the best way and most efficient way to do that is by using a payroll service. They're cheap, okay? And in the scale of things, they will save you more heartache they don't do anything, anything else. So use a payroll service. Use a responsible accountant. To, and if an account doesn't understand the difference between projection and cash flow, then I strongly urge you to see another accountant because there's a distinction between the two. You may have, in addition to it, you have to have reserve for maintaining your equipment and besides acquiring new one. And if you succeed, if you succeed and you start to develop a cash reserve, the idea is to hold on to it. Don't spend it. All right? I can't tell you how many uh, times I've seen a successful small businessman right, decide that he was going to be the big butter and egg man next and go out and buy himself a fancy new car or incur fancy new offices without reflecting upon uh, what he's going to do in terms of cash flow and the necessary requirements. So you have to pay, plan to maintain your assets, reserve for expansion, and, and understand the difference between fixed and variable expenses, because fixed expenses are what you, you're going to have to spend in your cash flow, and the variables are the ones that in the event your business has either an expansion or reduction, you can afford to float, okay? Or to quote Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And so you need to understand what you need, right, what your needs are, but still maintain the flexibility, okay, to afford your business, right? 
banking, uh, Madeline has already covered most of the banking issues. There, I have found uh, that mostly smaller banks are more responsive uh, to the smaller businesses, but each bank is out to loan money. They're, they make a profit loaning money, right? but they suffer a loss if they loan money and they don't get repaid. So their first focus is, how much do you want to borrow, okay? And what's your ability to repay it? And they're not gonna lend you the money to build a fancy premises or to divert the funds. They want you to use the funds to expand your business in a logical manner. And they wanna make sure through the use of cash flows that you have the ability to repay the loan in an orderly manner. They, they wanna make a profit. They don't wanna charge you default rates. They want you to come back expand your business and keep going. Clients are actually hard, customers are actually hard to find. Successful ones even harder. So to be a successful banker, you have to understand your client base in terms of how to make sure that they succeed in their businesses. And that has to be tied in with your cash flow. All right, so loan payment, source of funds, how are you using it? Loan repayment becomes extraordinarily important. The government under the new programs uh, provided the PPP because of COVID-19, prepared the uh, PPP loans and the SBA loans, call it the idle loans, okay? Uh, they're there for use and the programs have been expanded and I believe the others will talk about it more in a few minutes. There's one problem I have with borrowing money today. There are some of these merchant credit associations. They're basically, MC, the call, I call them MCAs. They are legalized Shylocking. And you must make sure that your, client, your friends, your friends and family stay away from the MCAs. The moment you bind yourself into an MCA, you're looking at a 30% or more right, interest rate and it's legal. What you're doing is you're selling your future receivables your future cash flow for an immediate cash bank. It's not in the client's or the customer's best interest. For that, Linda, have I exceeded my time? On target right now, so thank you. Okay. Uh, Robert Riquette, and, and thank you very much. And now we're going to hear from Sherry Lane, Executive Director of Capital Access and Center Operations for New York City Small Business Services, SBS who will explain some of the available opportunities and how to get different types of access to these. Great, well, first of all, thank you all so much for, for having me. Um, it's fantastic to hear from the other panelists and um, to have the opportunity to share with all of you um, some of the resources that SBS has to offer. Um, so I'm going to try and focus in here. I know we're limited in time and want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. Um, so what I wanted to cover is just a few of the many areas of free support that SBS offers um, and how to find that support. I know right now we're often all of us hearing, you know, there's this option for help and this option for help. And then the question is, well, how do I actually find it? So I'm going to try and connect those dots um, and I'll put my info in the chat at the end as well. So if, if folks have follow up questions, feel free to reach out. Um, so the few areas I wanted to focus on um, one uh, general reopening assistance, particularly for businesses that were forced to shut down temporarily um, Two, business education. And that's both for folks that are interested in starting up a new venture or have an existing venture and want to uh, kind of get a refresh on some of the nuts and bolts of running a business. And then three, um, financing assistance. So uh, we've talked a lot, Madeline mentioned a lot about uh, lending, um, but it's a very overwhelming topic. So I want to share a little bit about how SBS can help navigate that process. So quickly with the reopening assistance, just wanted to make sure everyone's aware we have um, regular information posted on the website. It's just nyc.gov slash business. We have webinars um, constantly coming out with the various phases. We know regulations are changing very quickly. Uh, it's a lot to digest. Um, so we're trying to synthesize that as much as possible. Um, so in terms of access, 
check out our website. And then also we have a hotline. It's 888-SBS-4NYC. Um, so I will, uh, I'll post these things in the chat once I'm finished speaking as well. So that's reopening. For business education, um, again, wanna, wanna point to the website for anything that I didn't cover, but as I mentioned, we have both webinars that are interactive uh, that usually are in person, but right now we've brought them um, to a virtual space, but they are interactive. They're ran by our network of business solution centers across the city. Um, and they cover topics from building a business plan, um, like Madeline was talking about, that is a, a detailed process and, and sometimes you don't know where to start. So we have some free courses on that. Um, we have courses on marketing, we have courses on um, financing. So feel free to check those out. They're all completely free. And those are the interactive courses. We also have um, a suite of online courses that are always online. Uh, through a partnership with a digital learning platform called Coursera. And again, those courses are available to help you either start up a new business, think about, you know, what's your idea, how to get it on paper, what are, what's the market that I want to serve. Um, feel free to check those out as well. There's also courses in that platform um, geared more towards operating businesses to help you sustain your business or grow your business. So, the website for that is um, nyc.gov slash business courses. So I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, and I wanted to start with talking a little bit about the business education piece, because I know we're talking mostly about financing here, but I want to just emphasize that hand in hand with any either application for a loan or taking on a loan, particularly now in these uncertain times, it's critical to have that harness on your budget, on your operations. Everything is changing like crazy right now. I don't have to tell, tell you all that you know. Um, so how in parallel to figuring out what are my financing options, you're also consciously thinking, how can I cut my costs down? How can I think of new ways to bring in revenue? These are really hard questions. It's not um, a simple thing that you can only learn in a class, but the classes can help kind of get those juices flowing and be thinking about, you know, what are other ways I can be adapting my existing business operations? Or if I'm thinking to start a business, how do I prepare myself to be flexible so I can survive in uh, this time with lots of variables? So that's why I wanted to kind of focus on the, on the business education resources first. Uh, that being said, with my remaining few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about the financing assistance that we offer. Um, so across the city, we have uh, business solution centers that are uh, staffed with uh, finance account managers that offer free one-on-one -on -one assistance to go through a lot of the, the binder that Madeline was talking about. Um, and the purpose of this is that's a lot of work. Sometimes when you're starting to apply for a loan, especially for the first time, you might not know what, where to find my P&L, what, what's a cash flow statement, you know, what are all these finances that I have to get together for the lenders, how do I tell my story in a way that's compelling. So we, we provide that service for free, um, both in terms of helping you put that package together, but also to try and navigate the space of a broad variety of lenders in the city. So again, to Madeline's point, every lender kind of has a different um, sweet spot, if you will. Uh, it's, it's kind of a gray, complicated um, world. So what we try and do is make that clearer and more accessible. So whether it's a, a lender offers a certain product that we know might be a good fit, we can help make that connection. Or um, sometimes it might come down to uh, the credit, credit score or the credit profile of a client. Some lenders are more strict than others. So we try and help navigate that process and help our clients understand what they might be eligible for. And then in certain situations, it might not be the best time to take on a loan. It might be the best time to focus more on what are my operations? How can I kind of tighten up my costs? Think of new revenue opportunities as well. So we try and help handhold through that process. And again, in terms of access, there's also a form online. Um, it's nyc.gov slash financing assistance. I'll put all these in the chat after, um, but that will allow you to fill out a simple form. 
online, give the information on a basic level about your business, about what kind of financing you're looking for, and it will help us connect you uh, with someone that can walk you through one-on-one -on -one or attend a small group session um, on what your options are. So um, we'll tell, we'll, in those sessions, we would talk about SBA products, about products that the city offers. The city offers a few products as well. Um, and we have relationships with lenders um, across the city to help try and find that perfect mix. So that's, I think, in a nutshell, some of the services we offer and how to find them. Um, I'll drop them in the chat and then happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Sherry. And, 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 and this has been, we've had so much interesting and important information that's being shared. And rounding out our panel is Patty Daly from uh, the Office of New York City Comptroller, uh, Scott M. Stringer. So Patty, tell us about MWBE University to start with. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Linda and Mark, Christian, Madeline from CB7. And shout out to Mike Stinson from our office, our Manhattan Borough Director, who connected me with you all. Uh, as Linda mentioned, my name is Patty Daleg. I'm the Deputy Chief Diversity Officer within the New York City Controller's Office. Um, if you don't know the controller, uh, Controller Scott Stringer is the Chief Financial Officer for the City of New York. He's the Chief Auditor, Chief Accountant. Uh, and the fiduciary to the city's pension funds. And our team's focus is to ensure that the city uses its financial power from contracts to investments, really to level the playing field for women and people of color. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a survey that we did of MWBEs on their challenges and experiences during COVID in applying for aid and applying for city contracts. Uh, we've seen nationwide that businesses owned by women and people of color are closing um, as a result of COVID. I'm sure Robert is very busy these days. Um, and so we wanted to take a look at MWBE specifically in New York. And this will give you some context on why it's important to reach out to people like Sherry and Madeline um, for support on, on financing and for uh, city contracts. So I'm going to share my screen so we can go through some of the findings. Um, it says host I may need screen. to help you do that. Give me one okay. second. No problem. Okay, try it now. All right. Yes. All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay, yes. great. So um, we did this survey, we, we reached about a, a 500 MWBEs throughout New York City um, for UCB7, you're obviously in Manhattan, so 32% of our respondents were in Manhattan. Um, we saw a breakdown in terms of minority group that matches uh, the breakdown of, of MWBEs across the city. So more than half were women, we saw about 34% were African American, 19% were Asian American, and 18% were Hispanic American. We saw a few emerging and local MWBEs, uh, emerging and local business owners in there as well. Um, and we saw that about half of respondents were in the professional services. Um, our first question was, are MWBEs able to access COVID-related contracts with the city? Um, we saw that 65% of respondents that shared information about their services said that they were ready and able to do business with the city. They did offer a, a service or a good that could help the city with relief efforts um, or recovery, but we only saw that about 62 were actually able to submit a proposal or, um, or try to compete for a contract and only 10 were able to receive a contract. Uh, so we saw that big disconnect between people who said they were able to offer and people that received contracts. And I'll share the, the link to these uh, survey results afterwards. Um, our next question was really around, did MWBEs in New York City receive relief? So did they get contracts and did they get relief? From the private sector, overwhelmingly, we saw that the answer was no. Um, Madeline was on some of our webinars from April, April through uh, beginning of July. We saw about 1,600 MWBEs and shared all of the private sector resources that we could find, but we still only saw 5% of the MWBEs in our survey actually got dollars from um, either, either 
uh, corporations that were doing um, that were donating dollars or to not from nonprofits. Um, when we look at the federal dollars, the EIDL and the PPP that um, that everyone has mentioned on the call so far, we saw really a mixed bag. Um, about 26% of NWBEs did not receive the EIDL, um, but we did see about 33% receive $50,000 or more. Um, and then we saw a mixed bag of like the smaller dollar amounts. And the same thing happened with the PPP. About 5% didn't did not receive the PPP. Um, and then we saw that the larger the dollar amount, the more received those dollars. Um, so it's, again, it was a mixed bag, about 45% of MWBEs that we surveyed uh, received 50 grand or more. Um, when we look at why people didn't apply and what barriers they faced in accessing federal, city, and private sector relief, we saw that 25% of MWBEs didn't even apply for federal or city funding. Um, they saw either restrictive application criteria or um, they were restricted in the use of funds. They didn't want to be subject to that debt or the high interest rates. Um, some folks didn't even know about it before it was closed or um, the money was gone before they had even applied. Uh, when we look at those that did apply but did not receive funding, Madeline mentioned this earlier, credit score was a big factor. Other uh, application criteria were other factors as well. For example, um, there were some uh, funds that required you to have a business size of two or more, so solopreneurs were left out. Um, others were still waiting for approval at the time that they uh, responded to the survey, and then others were rejected and weren't told why they were ineligible, couldn't reach a human to tell them why they were ineligible. And then again, we saw that funds were exhausted before their applications were processed. Um, the city did for a very brief time have um, funding available for businesses. We saw that only 40 of the businesses that we surveyed were able to put in an application for the city business continuity loan of the 40, only six were approved. And uh, when it came to the employee retention grant, we saw only 48 MWBEs applying and of that 15 were approved. Um, so given all of this, right, given a um, uh, mixed bag, mixed results in terms of relief funding, um, very little access to contracts, we see that the long-term viability of MWBEs is in question. 30% of MWBEs said that they would only be able to operate for a month or less given their current cash on hand. When we look at the six month outlook, 85% of MWBEs said that they don't have the cash on hand to go more than six months. Um, this is huge. Uh, we also know that it's because of this huge dip in revenue. We saw that 80% of MWBEs lost revenue, um, a median of about $38,000 between those months of March and May while we were in really the uh, thick of the pandemic here in New York City. Um, and so we asked, what, are the, what were the toughest things to pay for? Given that you um, have lost all this revenue, what's been the most challenging uh, expenses and we heard payroll and rent um, and this is all uh, because 35% of MWBs have not been able to operate during COVID-19. We did see that about 65% were able to operate either as essential businesses or as non-essential but online. So what did MWBs ask for? What do they want from the city of New York in order to have long-term sustainability, right? Um, over and over, we saw that they asked for more access to contracts, which is everything that we've heard from MWBEs, um, at least for as long as, as I've been in this position. <laughs> um, we also saw, okay, if I can't do business with the city, can I have some flexible grant and loan dollars for reopening? Um, can I have help with cleaning supplies, with PPE, with testing assistance, with marketing? Um, uh, as Sherry mentioned, the, the universe to navigate loans, grants, contracts is really challenging. It's a gray cloud. So they're asked, they ask for that one-on-one -on -one support to help navigate. Um, and then at the end of the day, people are just asking to get back to work. Uh, so this is what we found in our survey. Um, Linda had mentioned Controller MWBE University. This is an, 
a series of workshops that we put together to increase access to contracts for MWBEs. Our next one is on August 6th, um, and that is around how to do business with our office. So the controller does um, about does millions of dollars of contracts um, with professional services firms or standard services, catering, everything. So I'll drop the link in the chat. If you see that something you offer actually matches with something with our, within our office, you'll be uh, able to sign up for our event where you'll talk one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with the folks who actually do those purchases. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And I'll probably be I'll probably be there. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so once again, I want to thank our panelists. You were amazing, uh, Christian. I'm, you're taking it over with the chat and the yes. Q and A. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Well, we have uh, so far only one uh, question in the chat. So uh, we have uh, says, uh, uh, what's the interest rate of borrowing from a bank, and why is a bank better than finding investors? I wouldn't say a bank is greater than finding investors. It's just a different format of, of financing your company. Investors are normally used when you're starting up and you're looking for, for hard capital. Um, and you go to a bank uh, when you want additional working capital and that you, you have some years um, under you. I don't think many banks that I know of are doing pure startups. But there are a lot of alternative lenders that are doing startups. The first one that comes to mind, for instance, which also got additional monies this year from the CBFI, is True Fund. True Fund is one is located in New York City and does startups. Um, Acción New York is also that does startups, but at a smaller scale. So when I stated earlier that you need to understand where you're going for financing, I meant it um, because many banks are not, they're going to decline you based on lack of history. And it's not that we want to decline you. We have what's called regulators <laughs> that manage the banking industry and tell us what we can and cannot do. And that's, that's the way of life. That's life. So again, um, investors are not better than banks. Banks are not better than investors. It's just exactly what you need to understand what it is that you need and go for what is appropriately uh, going to suit your company. How do you spell true fund? Um, true oh, fund is P R U F U N D. Got it, yes. And then uh, Madeline uh, Innocent has his, uh, her hand off. I'm sorry? Uh, Madeline Innocent. Is that, uh, oh, the other Madeline. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to make more of a comment and, uh, and a broad question. Um, as only a couple of my board members know, um, I was self-employed. I wasn't an entrepreneur. Um, uh, my business was on 106th Street in Columbus Avenue, New Vanity Beauty Salon. Uh, before I left school, I always wanted to open my own business. Never thought about a bank. I'm just giving you a scenario of what type of people are out there that are needing help. But I went to my father and I presented him. I'm the only and first person in my family that has been self-employed. And I'm pretty proud of that. I wish it was still here, but neither here nor there. But um, I went to him and, and he funded me. I did well between uh, seven and eight years. And my employees were uh, people in the neighborhood who wanted a little cash, wanted something to do. They ran and they got my supplies. And, and that's how I kept people in the neighborhood employed. However, uh, my business collapsed when my my uh, mother passed away, my grandmother passed away, all my support system passed away. So they're still not thinking about a bank or getting any extra funds to reinvent my business. I lost a lot of my clientele. Finally, I went to work at New School University for 10 years. But there are people out there like me never think about banks. And that this is what my concern is. Because if there were people like me, as far as they're, they're self-sufficient and funding their own business. But this, this webinar here was, is so informative. I wish you knew you guys 25 years ago. <laughs> but how do you reach those people like me who went to family members, friends, whatever, to support their business? Like Robert was saying, cash in, cash out. That was my business. 
but if it, if it was in existence with the coronavirus, uh, I live in Niger. They would be evicting me right now because I would have no funds. Thank God for my family. But where are those people? You all spoke about it a little bit, but where are those people who never put in their mind that banks are available, different financial institutions are available, and they're just timid and going out there and finding what help can support their businesses. What can you say about that? Well, let me, let me give a crack at that. I think what you're doing right now is one of the ways. We need to continue day in and day out providing webinars and providing this information to all. The MWB University, what the Small Business Development Centers do, I mean, that is what we need to do. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, I do want to also state that for any of you that know of um, sole proprietors, independent contractors, they all qualify for the PPP program to survive during these oh. times. And we need to get that word out as well. I think the irony of um, small entrepreneurs not utilizing banks to the, to the extent they can is that they're still opening up bank accounts to maintain their funds and operating their businesses yet are limited to the access to capital from within those same banks. So we understand that, that's why we're an MDI. And we try to not only work with all the small business development centers, the SBDCs, and the controller's office to just promote and get the word out. I think education right. is key to how our entrepreneurs survive. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, we have another question from the chat from Melanie Westock, which may have been answered already. It says, uh, what advice do you have for sole proprietors? I am a one person photography business. I haven't worked since March. It feels like I'm starting over after 20 years in business. He qualifies, that individual qualifies for the PPP right now. So if I were you, that's what I would do, sir. Um, and you have 24 weeks to utilize the capital in other words to pay yourself because you are a sole proprietor. Um, I would advise you to revisit our website at www.ponsebank.com and apply with the documentation that we're requesting. It'll take you at least two and a half, it'll cover at least two and a half months of your own salary. Okay. That's why, I mean, that is open right now. It's going to close down as per SBA by August 8th, but you can still, you, you still have time. Uh, and there was another comment that said uh, PPP. Before you leave that, all right, remember, it's a, mm -hmm. the PPP loan is a grant. It covers right. two months of, of your average monthly payroll for 2019, plus a factor including rent and uh, insurance of approximately 25%. Because of that, it's a grant. So it, it's a two-step process. You apply for the loan, and then you apply for the grant that covers the loan. To the extent the grant doesn't cover the loan in full, the interest rate is, right, 2%? Uh, 1%. 1%. So right, it is foolish not to go immediately and make the application, but you got to follow up, right? to ask for the grant portion of it by December 31. Yeah, the forgiveness, uh, what Robert is alluding to is the actual forgiveness side of that loan. Um, only after you have expended the funds can you ask for the forgiveness portion of it. But look at it this way. You are applying for two and a half months of your own salary, so that's definitely going to be spent, so the forgivable amount will be the same amount of the loan. Um, it's a win-win, and you only, you're running out of time, so please apply right away. And, uh, well, yeah, and can I just add quickly, um, uh, Robert, I think that's a great point that it can be forgivable, but you have to go through the loan forgiveness application in order for it to be forgivable. Otherwise, that's, you know, an additional monthly payment. So that's another thing that the business solutions centers can help you with. Again, to Madeline's point, you have to spend the money first on the eligible uh, uh, purposes, but afterwards, definitely go through that forgiveness application and it makes the loan forgiven, which effectively turns it into a grant. Right. I think what I want to add as it relates to the forgiveness side of the house of the PPP right now, as we speak in legislation, 
um, they are evaluating what's called a P4. That's the fourth stage of this program. And within that, they are evaluating nationally what, whether or not they're going to forgive, no questions asked, any loans up to $150,000. I'm recommending any of our elected officials that are on this call to please consider promoting that because most of the entities that we help finance were loans under $75,000. Um, and anything under 150,000 will help this entrepreneur out. And the forgiveness application, when it first came out, it was monstrous. So then they came out with the easy one, which still is going to need Robert and or Sherry's help to complete, right? Um, so we're looking forward to the P4 uh, materializing itself, hopefully soon within August or so. But from a bank's perspective, we cannot wait for that to pass. Okay, so uh, there were uh, two comments from Sharon Richter I'd like you to comment on, if appropriate. It says, PPP doesn't help a sole proprietor that isn't making enough money to take a salary. And also, PPP, PPP also doesn't help anyone that is showing a Schedule C loss. On the Schedule C loss, that is correct. On a sole proprietor, your salary is your salary. And as long as you provide the documentation, it should. So I don't know where they're getting that information from, Christian. Thank you. Uh, okay, I don't see anybody else uh, uh, asking a question. So, uh, Alinda? I think we've, we've almost met our time. Uh, again, um, I want to thank our panelists for, for your time. I want to thank everybody who joined oh, us. Uh, Doc Kleiman, uh, has his price. Uh. <laughs> okay, good. Hi, I actually thought this was seminar was going on a little longer. I'm so grateful for everybody and it's, I really, all this information is so chock full of, of just important stuff. I, uh, in my personal life, I, I'm a commercial real estate broker and I represent tenants and landlords. So I'm often in a position of advocating for a tenant and helping them prepare. And also I'm sometimes on the landlord uh, side where we're reviewing these documents to evaluate a tenant. So um, a couple of things, first of all, I'll just try to fire them off because I know we're, we're pressed for time. Um, Something that Madeline said, uh, I just had a question about that banks speak to each other. Um, so I know just from my own personal credit history that when somebody, when you apply for credit, if you have too many inquiries, the first uh, that counts against you, um, unless it's your, a self-inquiry or you're taking advantage of the free credit report that each credit agency offers each year. So my question is, I guess, well, what's a question and a comment? I always advise my clients that to be careful with whom you are applying and really go with your first choice first because your second choice, your, you may have a ding. But what I didn't know, and maybe Madeline can explain, what, what is allowed for, for one bank to another to speak to each other? I thought that was fairly confidential other than it credit is, reporting. It is, Doug, but um, when many entrepreneurs submit their same package to different bankers, Okay, that's issue number one. Um, and when one banker has turned them down, they'll continue to go to different bankers. And what I say um, in terms of relationship that bankers have with each other, they'll call and say, why did you decline this one? Or do you know about this deal? Another thing is that if I cannot do that loan and I know of a bank that can do it, then I will refer it out. And that's what I meant by talk to each other. Now, let me also quickly answer your credit question. There is what we call a hard pull and a soft pull. A soft pull will only have, allow the banker to just check out what's on your credit. It would not be registered with the credit bureaus. A hard pull will. So you have the right to ask whoever you're submitting your package to um, and control that. You have to manage expectations. Unless they're going to give you a firm offer, they should not do a, a hard pull. If they're just evaluating and seeing whether or not they can do it, they are allowed to do a soft pull. Thank you. And, and my, my follow-up is just simply that uh, what I do to, to advise um, some of, uh, of minority-owned businesses and women businesses, sometimes uh, their first language is not English. And that does not mean in any way that they aren't a viable business and, and uh, entrepreneur. So, but sometimes they may per be perceived that way because they aren't able to articulate themselves in writing or in person. Um, so I'm so grateful for um, what, what uh, Sherry said about being able to put together these documents before they get to 
the decision makers because some you, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Right. So, and the last thing is that sometimes I advise startups. I always say startups are not a dirty word. Starbucks was one store once. So especially now that landlords have a lot of vacancies, I hope it creates more opportunity for minority owned and women owned businesses and startups uh, because landlords can't be quite as picky, quite frankly. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's just really important, um, I think, to, to also uh, have advisors, perhaps someone who is already a few steps down the road where if you want to open a, a, a nail salon or a beauty salon or whatever it be, bring in a partner because that automatically ups the ante. And of course that ties into what Robert said about your partnership agreements and everything else. But anyway, I just, I think it's terrific what's being discussed here and we need so much more of it. Thank you. Wow, okay, so thank you. We have, we, we are, we're right at, we're a minute late. Um, but I, I, once again, I, I wanna thank our panelists. Um, and if, if, if you have any questions for them, uh, you can contact me, you can contact Christian and we will get the information over to them ASAP, or you have the information for SBS and the Office of Comptroller and Ponce uh, Bank and Madeline Marquez. So once again, thank you very much. Robert L. Rattet, partner, Davidoff Hutcher and Citron LLP. Madeline B. Marquez, Senior Vice President and Chief of External Affairs Officer for Ponce Bank. Uh, Sherry Lane, Executive Director of Capital Access and Center Operations, New York City Small Business Services, SBS. And Patty Dalek, Patricia Dalek, Deputy Chief of Diversity, Office of Comptroller, Scott M. Singer. Have a wonderful afternoon, folks, and thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Everybody have a good afternoon. <laughs>